If we carry on the way we are doing, then we will certainly pollute. But we can change our ways, and that's basically what we're talking about here. It's going to need technology and it's going to need money. So let me say a few words about uh, the amount of money and how does one raise that money or how does one frame that uh, uh, financing picture, as Eddie just did. Firstly, we're talking about in the order of, let's say, $100 billion a year um, for transfer of technology, for climate resilient adaptation activities and mitigation activities in the developing world, which primarily will have to come from the developed world. Um, I used to think that was a huge number, but I recently have changed my, my mind about huge numbers. 100 billion is no longer a huge number. If the world were a, a, a failing bank, then a trillion dollars would appear immediately. So, you know, if we can't find that kind of money to save the world, uh, then we have our priorities absolutely screwed up. Uh, so it's not that big, but it is certainly big and we need to think about ways of raising it. Let me give another framing of what one wants to compare it with in terms of if one does simply a cost-benefit analysis from the perspective of the developed countries. If they don't invest that kind of funding in getting a global uh, action to mitigate and reduce emissions drastically over the next decade, then they are going to face a bill in the many hundreds of billions of dollars to protect their own citizens. Remember, climate change impacts will not just affect the poor, and poor countries. They will immediately, but in the longer term, in the next decade or two decades or three decades, if we don't take action, then nobody will escape. And the rich countries, when they start looking at the bill to protect themselves, they're looking at a huge bill. I'll just give you one example. I, where I live in London, we have something called the Thames Barrier that protects the city of London from flooding. It was designed to last another 50 years. It's not going to last that long because it's being used 10 times more than it was designed to use. It's going to cost them a billion pounds just to retrofit it. You know, England is rich. They can find the money. They will do it. The Netherlands will find the money to build their dikes. But they're not going to be able to protect everything, and they're going to have to face a huge bill, many orders of magnitude bigger than the $100 billion that would be needed now. So even in their own cost-benefit terms, for the rich countries, it is wise investment to put the hundred billion dollars on the table now in order to prevent the many times that figure that will affect them if they don't do this. So let me just close by saying the following. I think one of the biggest problems that we face in the negotiations, uh, particularly the climate change negotiations and, and as we go forward to Copenhagen, is the mindset of our leaders who are doing the negotiating they are still stuck in a mindset of thinking about national interests and how to get the best deal for their own country. Now, under normal circumstances in any international negotiations, that would be a good thing for them to do. That's their job, to protect their citizens. But in climate change, that doesn't work. Doing a good deal for your own country, if you're going to ruin the planet for everybody, is not a good deal. What they need to be thinking about is doing a good deal for their children and grandchildren, and our children and grandchildren. So what they represent is not just leaders of one country defending the interests of their country, but leaders of this generation deciding what kind of planet we're going to leave behind for our children and grandchildren. It's not something that they generally think about, but it is something that they will have to do if they're going to come up with the courage and the policies that are going to be needed to solve this problem. Thank you. Very much indeed. Thank you. Well, we, we've heard a great... Uh, array of perspectives there, but largely from, if you like, the developing world perspective, the, the, the crying need for, for finance, for technology, for a response from the developed world. So as I throw this open to the floor, uh, among many questions and observations it would be nice to, to hear about is perhaps the developed world perspective, because obviously we are in a recession. And Selim, as you said, one of the knock-on effects of that is if you like, a, a tendency to, to look after national interests first. Protectionism is, is, a, is a creeping uh, tendency in that. When, as we approach Copenhagen, clearly that's not exactly going to help this uh, particular debate. Um, so let's see, we've got uh, a hand in the other. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Jim. Uh, I'm Roger Martin, the Optimum Population Trust, and apologies to those who've heard me before. But um, as a developing, developed country uh, citizen and taxpayer, I totally endorse this comment that 100 billion no longer seems a big number. Uh, the citizens of my country, I think, have been, of course, stunned by the amount of money immediately produced 
to bail out bankers who've made catastrophic blunders by gambling recklessly with other people's money in a, some fictitious world of electronic numbers. Um, so, so I quite agree with him on that, and it's a very major point. It's a good hard figure, 100 billion. Uh, I wanted to make the point from an organization who has constantly tried to link, to get understanding of the link between human numbers and every problem. Yesterday, we heard Margaret Chan and Barbara Stocking and our chair, our chief executive, admit that not a single problem addressed by this conference would not be easier to solve with fewer people and does not get harder and ultimately impossible to solve with ever more. The primary aim of my organization is to get a population stabilization policy in place in the UK by 2015, and we may get there as a model to other developed countries, but I would like to suggest that human numbers are central to the question of climate change. Who do you want to when put the question to? It, well, yeah. I want to put it to the panel, but I want to put, you know, do, do you agree? In mitigation, uh, there will be huge advantage in reducing the additional number of rich, major emitters, minor victims, and in adaptation, there will be equally huge advantage in reducing the number of future additional poor, um, uh, major victims, minor emitters. Either okay, way, let's, let's, let's put the problem let's, becomes let's, easier to solve with, and if this is put in the, in the okay. equation. Th th thank you very much. I mean, uh, perhaps, Lauren, do you want to pick that up in, 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 from the perspective of the Philippines, how that plays out? Thank you. Well, um, for the uh, vulnerable countries, actually, it is adaptation that we must be focused on. Very clearly, how can um, an island state like Kiribati, yesterday the president was here, um, think about mitigation when they will be gone in 40 years. Uh, Maldives has uh, put a point by going carbon neutral in 10 years, even if they say, the scientists say they will be gone in 40 years as well. What do we do with a uh, country like Bhutan, whose uh, glacial lake outburst floods cause the landslides and floods um, occasionally? What do we do with a country of 90 million Filipinos uh, in the Philippines that wants to do um, mitigation, but we are a 0.01% polluter and we are not industrialized, so we must do adaptation. Mitigation uh, must be done by everyone, but most especially the developed nations who have caused all this. And therefore, those developed nations must also assist the uh, affected countries, uh, the vulnerable countries, in terms of adaptation. Of course, adaptation funds um, are controlled by the developing countries, but um, as suggested by uh, the UN um, Under Secretary General John Holmes, there must be some percentage of humanitarian aid and ODA allotted, not only for disaster reduction, but also climate change adaptation. And um, earlier, David mentioned that, of course, we are in a recession. It would be very difficult to impose upon the rich developed nations to contribute to adaptation funds uh, to, to affected and vulnerable countries. However, a proactive, innovative, out-of-the-box approach could be reassessing parts of the debt and actually finding out which debt could be utilized for debt for nature, debt for reforestation, debt for disaster risk reduction swap agreements that will not come out of the pocket of um, developed nations but are uh, needed and actually uh, could be utilized effectively by the developing nations. So that, I believe, is a doable, implementable solution as long as the developed nations will be willing to uh, assess the um, hierarchy of debt of developed nations. One of, exam I, I want to be micro and concrete about it. Out of the 1.4 trillion pesos of the Philippine annual budget, 45% uh, goes to debt service. 55% remains uh, for 92 million Filipinos to, to uh, utilize for social services. The World Bank estimates that 30% of that 55% goes to corruption. That leaves 25, I'm being, being very honest and candid about it, 25% of the 1.4 trillion goes to social services. That is the reason why people are poor. Not because we are poor, but because there is misallocation, misappropriation, and because there is corruption. So it is weak governance. It